Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. We've got a good in for you uh, this time. We have uh, Dr. David Gooden on talking about his uh, new oh, book, Confronting... <laughs> about his new book, Confronting Evil, The Odyssey in the We Eastern just confronted Pacific. evil right here in the form of that pun. Yeah. This is diabolic punishment flowing, <laughs> flowing from the underworld out of my mouth. Uh, Dr. Gooden, thanks for joining us. Yes, I'm curious about what's in your drinking glass now after that very jovial introduction. Yes. That, did you bring enough for the whole class? Because I'm just drinking coffee and I feel very left out. And I'm drinking ice water. Or is it vodka? Yeah. We'll uh, have to see how the show vodka. goes. Yes. yes. The, the audience will find out if it's vodka by about the halfway point. So... Uh, <laughs> Dr. Gooden, we're excited to to jump in and talk about your book. Before we do, talking about hell, talking about <laughs> evil, <laughs> talking about the devil. We, we have talk about the devil here, talk about all that stuff. We have to open the show with a commercial for our Patreon because if we don't, no one will hear it. Unfortunately, the reality of it. So, patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can sign up for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that so you don't have to worry about us putting out a, a million pieces of media and charging you a million dollars. To be honest, we charge for about five or six pieces of media. The rest are all free. Some months we put out uh, the counting the live streams on Twitch now like 12 or 15 pieces of media so it's a real bargain uh if uh you uh, don't want to do the patreon uh, you can go to paypal.com slash gnostic and do one-time donations and uh speaking as a uh perpetually broken poor person uh who will probably be this way until i die in the street like a dog i understand if you are unable to help us out financially you can help us out in other ways uh tell people about the show share it on your social media uh send Send it uh, to a friend. Uh, all jokes aside, like mouth to ear uh, is, is very powerful, still works really well. So take your favorite show. It's probably going to be this one. You know, send it to a friend and be like, you know, have you'll have a good in time. Okay, uh, we can get right into it. Uh, Dr. Gooden, I, I opened up the sheet with a real quick question. If you could answer like one or two words or one or two sentences, why does evil exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow it? Okay, I, I'm kidding with that. Uh, uh, Dr. Gooden, can, can you tell us what the Odyssey is and what, what that okay. term means, what people mean by it? Well, the Odyssey, uh, it's a very academic term. It means a theological explanation or justification for the problem of evil. And of course, that presupposes we know what we're talking about when we say the problem of evil. So we should take a little bit of time to unpack that. Um, Evil has been claimed to be the greatest argument the atheists have for the non-existence of God. Because if there was a God and he's benevolent and kind, as described in the New Testament, then why is the world the way it is? Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? And really good things happen to very terrible people. Who is the administrator of this divine economy? So that is the problem of evil as it's sometimes posed. Academics then take hold of it and engage with that, and that's typically called the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to pause just to see if uh, you guys disappeared from my screen. It's a little bit disorienting. Oh, wait. So I'll We're let back. you have the follow-up to that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have more questions. You, yes. you know, immediately it does launch into, when I think about the Odyssey, that you, there, there's a common, a common response that the Gnostics try to solve it with the Demiurge. Um, which I'm not exactly sure that that's mm -hmm. what the first original Gnostics were doing. Uh, and I think they're a little bit more sophisticated by uh, than that. And if you look at the mythology, it doesn't really quite work. It doesn't really solve yeah. the, the, uh, the, the, the question and, and answer to why there's evil. Um, but that, that's all I've got to say. Uh, Lady, do you have anything on Theodicy? Um, I do have a, one question, um, and that is... Could you try, Professor, to make some kind of a distinction between sin and evil? Um, when does sin become evil? Are our actions evil or are people evil? Um, because I, I that, that's something I think that, that's a tension there that um, I'd like to at some point unpack. That's actually the perfect question. 
And I do like the tripartite screen because when you go to just an isolation on me, I lose sense of communication. So if oh. we, I mean, well, it's yeah, a directorial. Okay, yeah. good. Oh, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> you guys disappeared yeah. on me. It's so. <laughs> but this is actually the question that I had to begin with to write my book because, and this is going to be the most controversial thing I say tonight. We all need to be a little bit Kantian in how do we choose our definitions? What is evil? Evil is a term that just is a term of outrage. In fact, one of my research areas is Ethiopia. And in, in Ethiopia, there's a tree that's called an evil tree. Hmm. It's not evil. It's just ecologically harmful. It's an evasive exotic. But people sensationalize it by adding a description, evil, in order to get attention. So what do we mean by evil? And we need to parse out exactly what is meant. Because there's a metaphysical discussion and then there's the phenomenal evils we experience as aging and death, trauma and suffering, mm -hmm. um, and crime and injustice. And when you use the correct term, evil is something you have no power over. But crime and injustice actually presupposes there's a response to be made. Mm -hmm. And trauma, it presupposes that there's actions we can take to help others or to give others the resources they need to to work through that so with the correct terms the discussion suddenly becomes one that is fruitful one is mm -hmm. that is productive rather than an abstraction called evil because what can you do against evil it's so vague and impersonal mm -hmm. and so as i approach the topic of the book it's like we need to what do we exactly mean by evil there's metaphysics and we can talk about demiurges and you know, other conceptions of evil. And then there's what people experience in their lives. There's crime and injustice, pain and suffering, aging and death. And so the first, like the, well, I believe the first chapter of my book is called The Problems with the Problem of Evil. Because the problem of evil is thrown out there as something that's unsolvable. And it's a great mystery. And the atheist cow with the uh, theologians into the corner saying, how do you justify this? How do you explain this? And you, all you can say, the providence of God is a mystery. But if you start using the right words, then you actually get productive answers about what is presupposed in particular theological worldview. So, of course, I'm working from the Eastern Orthodox Christian worldview. But I also wrote the book as a guidepost that for other religious traditions, this is how you approach a problem of evil. Be precise about what you're talking about. Don't try to erase the problem of evil by just giving it a new name, but with the right descriptive name, you get the right presupposed actions that you're supposed to do. And uh, Lena, you uh, actually identified sin as comes up in the discussion quite often in Orthodox patristics. And sin from the Greek, as I'm sure you well know, means to miss. miss it's not mark. a moral judgment. Yeah. It's not you're dirty, you're bad. It's there was an intentionality to your life. And if you fail to become what you've always meant to be, whether that's a great parent or a teacher or someone, you know, whatever it is, that is sin. And when sin occurs, then evil is perpetuated in the world for, you know, various, because that failure to manifest that intentionality that was given to you uh, through your creation. But here, I just want to stop for questions because I feel I'm rambling, though you say you encourage that. We encourage it. Uh, to clarify, is sin, a, it's, it's an archery term? It's, it's the missing Correct. the bullseye? Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So no. any misdirection life, if like your parents force you to be an engineer and you've always meant to be an architect, you're not living your true life. You're not being true to yourself. And that causes some psychological dissonance uh, within a person. Mm -hmm. So it actually becomes a very interesting question, a very productive question of, what is your true self? Who are you meant to be? Is it to be an accountant? Is it to be a bank manager? Is it to be, um, you know, a parent and a friend? It's these are the type of questions that reveal, you know, one, the key to your own happiness and two, being constructive and helpful in the world. So sin has a lot of baggage of dirtiness and morality. And it's not really meant that way. It's like there's intentionality to why you were created. You need to find out what that is. Yeah. 
Well, I, I guess I, I, I'm going to barrel on through through our question, Sheedy, even though sure. there, there's a lot I want to unpack there. But I, I want to know, why did you write your book? Why did you feel like it was needed? And for those out here who, who don't know, who's Richard Dawkins and, and why does he matter to your project? Why does he <laughs> yeah. play a role in your book? Well, I remember as an undergraduate being interested in the problem of evil. I was a religious studies minor with a... I was majoring in environmental studies, actually. Mm -hmm. And the problem of evil, everyone's lives has been touched by evil in one form or another. And if it hasn't, just wait, it will. <laughs> so you have that to look forward to, boys and girls. But the problem of evil is, it's always put out there as the big problem. So I went to the library, and it's like, find the section of uh, the Dewey Decimal System that has the academic responses to the problem of evil, the theodicy section. And I just parked myself in front of it and started pulling books off the shelf, looking to see what the experts had to say. And what I found was a whole lot of disappointment. There was one book in particular, I since forgotten the author and the exact title of the book, but it revealed something to me that eventually would inspire me to write my own book. And what I read were two sentences that were really powerful. The first sentence was, theologians will say, that evil is merely the absence of good, just as darkness is the absence of light. That hmm. sentence one. So I said, okay, that's actually kind of nice. The second sentence is, but you would not say that to a parent whose child's been diagnosed with cancer. I said, rhetorically, mm -hmm. that is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's like a sucker punch. You kind of yeah. set up with a nice sentence of, oh, there's some beautiful poetry about darkness and light. And then what if your child's diagnosed with cancer? And then I read on, and the book got into nothing other than ridiculing religion. Mm -hmm. That it's absurd. I've done all the critical analysis I need to do. And even as an undergrad at 20 years old, I realized there was a deception in what I read. Because the question wasn't, what do you say to a parent whose child's been diagnosed with cancer? The question was, what is evil? So that response, you know, evil is the absence of good, as darkness is the absence of light, is the answer to the problem of evil. But there's a second question. What do you mm -hmm. say to someone who's dealing with pain and suffering, trauma, a sick child? That's a different question. And that inspired me to write the book because I have to divide out the problem of evil to there's academic questions and then there's the pastoral considerations oh. of what do you do with struggling with evil in the real world? So the book actually divides right in half that the first half deals with the academic, the easy part. Yeah. You, you want to talk about metaphysics? There's no <laughs> emotional stake involved in talking about metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Then you talk about real people, real incidences, real suffering in the world, and what is the answers from this religious tradition, Eastern Orthodox. And so the problem of evil is really simple, but it's very complicated about how to present it. Because the experience of evil is you can't debate a grieving parishioner. No. They're in pain. Yeah. You give them space to have this. And so the question of evil, it gets mixed up in everything else and nothing productive happens from it. So my book says, we're going to talk about metaphysics and then we're going to talk about all the various evils in the world. And I use various case studies. And so I realized most academic discourses just cons consider it a big mess that's unsolvable and the atheists have taken the higher ground and kind of lord it over anyone who's the theistically open. And that inspired me to write the book as well. If I want to ramble for a, a second, I thought about this anecdote uh, in preparation for tonight's talk, that I grew up with an older brother, nine years older, and his favorite game was heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> And he made me play it over and over again until I cried because it brought him joy. And apparently there was a lesson there to be learned that I was stupid. And that is how the problem of evil is actually argued. That evil becomes a term for anything disadvantageous in life. And good is everything good in life. And if God does not cater to people's needs and wants, then God must be evil. Because heads I win, evil is anything I don't like, and good is everything that I want, then if that is the game, it can't be won. 
So you do have to be Kantian. You have to establish what exactly do you mean by good and what exactly do you mean by evil. And once you do that, the book was actually pretty easy to write. Uh, you know, it was just figuring out how to parse out the subjects in a logical matter, manner and ask the reader, be patient until I get to the pastoral considerations at the end. Yeah. You know, when you were describing this early on and you were talking about the, the academic and the pastoral, um, it reminded me when I was, when I was in seminary and, and, you know, our pastoral care classes, but um, what came, the verse that came to mind when you, when you were speaking on it, where the verse came, came to mind was um, the word made flesh. Um, you know, you start out with this, the, the logos, um, and there it is, and you can look at it, you can study it, you can, and but then it, it at some point it has to become flesh, and that embodiment of the person who is acting in the pastoral role was somebody who has undergone a, a traumatic experience or a violation or a soul crushing experience, that is in an entirely different place. And that's, there's that becoming in between those, that, 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 that bridge. That's what just came to mind when you were describing this. Uh, that's a beautiful way of describing it because that is indeed enfleshed theology. Yeah. Because it's not abstract. Suddenly in pastoral care, you're dealing with someone who's overcoming trauma. Either they themselves have suffered or sometimes even more terrible, their powerlessness to help someone else who's been traumatized. Yes. And what is required then is real, genuine presence. And so the word becoming flesh is what is needed, not abstractions, not words, not theoria, but the actual praxis of being there and helping someone through that journey. Mm -hmm. I, I, unless you want to interject, that kind of reminded me of one of the, the framing verses or books of the Bible I used uh, in developing my manuscript. I was really struck, I've always been struck by the book of Jonah, mm -hmm. which is sometimes treated as a fairy tale or a child's tale about an old man in the belly of a big fish. <laughs> but the story ends in a very peculiar way. Jonah rages at God over something that seems incidental, but it was something that set him off. And he screams at God, I am angry unto death, to God's face. This is realness, <laughs> we can put in that sense. But that's where the book ends. Jonah outside the walls of Nineveh, wanting no part of being welcomed into that city, which prefigures the heavenly Jerusalem. The book is prophetic. It has an ap apocalyptic sense to it, too. It prefigures the kingdom of heaven. And Jonah's excluding himself because of trauma he suffered. Because if you look at his story, Jonah's depressed. He mm -hmm. hides from God in the belly of a ship and sleeps down in the ship, even though it's over, there's a storm. He's not asleep, he's just depressed. And if you know the historical context for the book, it is because the northern king of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians. The capital city of Assyria was Nineveh. God sent Jonah to the people who destroyed his kindred, and they actually repented. And this traumatized Jonah. And so this image of Jonah outside the walls, in his own pain, in a need to give his pain meaning and significance by holding out against God, I will be the one that points at God's face and say, you are wrong. I am angry unto death. And so this book was written is how do we get Jonah from outside the walls to at least be willing to maybe walk to the gates of the city? How do we get him moving back toward the city? And that was the image I had when I started writing this book is someone ultimately pain is the wedge evil drives between a person and God. And sometimes people only have their own spite, their own anger to keep themselves together when they suffer trauma. They just grit their teeth, they get pissed, and they do their work, they do their job, they go about their life, but they're angry, they're angry, mm -hmm. they're angry, just like Jonah. And that one thing can set them off. How do you get such a person to move back toward God? And Jonah blames God for his own problems. So it's a very powerful image. And I think it's deliberately in the Hebrew Bible to have that unresolved tension. 
between a people and a God and anger? And how do we bring them together? How do we have a new covenant where healing can take place? And so Jonah outside the walls is one of the images I use when designing my book. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, that's always been one of my favorite books of the Bible, and I find it goes very well, hand in hand with Job. And again, I, I am depressed and saddened when people just see it as that fairy tale. They just think of the whale, right? Because I, I, I find it an incredibly profound book. Um, and, you know, that's what I love particularly. You, if you do talk to atheists, if you uh, talk to people who, who don't know the Bible very well, they, they assume that the Bible is, is like a new age book that just, you know, uh, tells fables that are then very clearly uh, explained and gives very direct uh, uh, teachings when, of course, particularly um, in the Hebrew Bible, that there, there's a, it's, it's very challenging and it doesn't stop to hold your hand and say, this is what the story means. And this is the teaching. And this is just a metaphor. And this character means this, and this character means that there's none of that. Right. And, and, uh, uh, I, I'm bringing this back to Dawkins, uh, um, yes. which is, you know, how sophisticated, and how challenging and how much you have to engage with these books, uh, which is completely missing from, from the, the atheist, and particularly what was called the new atheist movement. And um, uh, Dr. Gooden, to go, go back to my own undergrad doing religious studies, you know, everybody kept telling me, you know, you got to read this Dawkins book. You got to read this Dawkins book. So, you know, I'm like, well, this man's a scientist. He's He's well-respected in his field from what I understand. So I was expecting not to agree with it as a person of faith, but to find an interesting and challenging uh, arguments. But instead, it was it was dumb. It was embarrassing. I read it and I felt embarrassed for him. I'm like, why did his editor let him do this? This is, <laughs> you know, at least Christopher Hitchens was entertaining, right? Also wrong, <laughs> but at least he was fun to read. This is just... Uh, this is just sad. Uh, okay, um, uh, moving on. Uh, can you tell us about some of the misconceptions that, that people have about the Odyssey and the philosophy of the patristic literature from the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition? Uh, yes, I'm just wondering where to begin. There is uh, quite a bit that's been said here. Uh, well, let's, I guess, briefly revisit Dawkins. Um, I was surprised, too, when I read his book, and because the arguments aren't that sophisticated. No. He's, if I can, uh, I mean, what I want to say, the idiom is he's preaching to the choir. He's preaching to an audience that already believes religion is dumb. And so perhaps he feels he doesn't really have to establish arguments. And what it comes down to, he says, well, you can't prove the non-existence of God just because you can't prove the non-existence of anything but he goes to links to show how God is so improbable as to beg all, you know, all reasonable people to, to warrant that. And that's as sophisticated as he gets. And so I have a chapter kind of set aside to his arguments and where, where he takes his own shortcuts. And, you know, uh, when uh, you have a chance, take a look at chapter two, I get into that. But ultimately, it's rhetoric, it's persuasion, it's not proof of anything. If you're inclined to be atheist, you're convinced that this is enough to justify your atheism. And my concern is, if you're someone struggling in your faith, it could be very demoralizing to listen to these arguments. And I wanted to write a book that at least gives someone struggling with their faith a, the intellectual legitimacy in order to hold on to the faith. Now, where Dawkins starts getting to some interesting territory, though he actually surprisingly doesn't head toward the unreasonableness of the Odyssey, that in the Western paradigm, what has come to dominate is certain Augustinian views over the providence of God. And my apologies to all Augustinians <laughs> out there, but just to package it succinctly, Augustine will have human nature controlled by sin. And it's only by intervention from God are some people saved. There's no such thing as free will other than the free will to choose whatever sin you want to do today. So that's the limit of free will is just choosing which seven deadly sins are on the agenda. And that would develop into the views of predestination. 
that even before you were born, even before you exist, you are damned for eternity. And no matter what you do in your life, if God does not give you the grace, you will never repent. And so on one hand, this paradigm was seen as necessary to protect the honor and dignity of God over badly thought out consequences of what Augustus was dealing with. Why did the barbarians sack Rome, which was a Christian city? And so we had to come up with this, you know, the cities of God and cities of man and sin and the true city. And ultimately has God responsible for all the outcomes just through his mm -hmm. omniscience. He's able to ensure in the long run, God gets what God wants. And so Judas was always destined to betray Jesus, but it was useful to his plan. And Judas was just a victim in it all. Other than he was created to be bad, therefore there's no fault responsibility to, you know, to his actions because he's never had a choice in the matter. So Augustine tries to solve one problem, but he makes people not responsible for their own lives, whether they right. become saved or they become right. damned. And the Calvinists would take Augustine, put him on steroids, <laughs> and make original sin into total depravity, and make Christ's sacrifice as limited atonement. Only certain people are saved, the Calvinists. And no one mm. else. And that is a paradigm that's very hard to, to defend um, theodicy because it has, got, even if people are mere puppets in a cosmological scheme of redemption history, our lives as we experience have meaning. Mm -hmm. And people suffer, people die. There are are children dying in impoverished countries from starvation. And it's like, where is God in all this? If God controls every outcome, if there's only one, you know, the unmoved mover behind it all, then God is responsible for Judas's betrayal of Christ and for starving children in Africa and every other evil in the world. And ultimately the atheists, that becomes their strongest selling point that this image of God is a monster. Mm -hmm. Because he only cares about certain people, and everyone else is just pawns in a cosmological game they can never win. Heads I win, tails you lose, once again. And so that is the Western paradigm and why I found the Eastern literature much more refreshing, because it holds up free will. Free will is always part of God's plan, and God allows free will, you know, for his own, for the for our own acquisition of virtue. And we'll get into some of those subjects, I think in a moment, but I definitely want to stop here for follow-up questions. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't really have a follow-up question, except that, you know, perhaps history would be very different if those plums hadn't been so tasty, or if he hadn't thought about a pretty girl while at the bathhouse with his dad. Uh, but when, when you said about insulting Augustinians, I don't think we're going to have a lot watching the show. I think you're going to be okay there. But awesome. if we get any angry letters, I'll forward them. Uh, the yes. Bishop? One of the things, I mean, I, I'll, if I may, I'm just going to digress just momentarily here because this conversation is bringing up a lot for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So many years ago, I was part of a group of bloggers focusing on International uh, Women's Month, and I wrote um, and I wrote a piece about the unnamed concubine in Judges. Um, if there's a, you know, I mentioned Jonah before. I'm thinking if there's a story that um, typifies evil for me, it was mm -hmm. what happened to her. Uh, we, it begins with there were no kings in Israel. And we find this concubine who was trying to get away from uh, her, her, her male keeper. Um, her father is powerless to stop this. And he basically turns her over to a mob where she is raped to death or nearly to death. And he becomes very indignant, um, not, not even taking his own um, part in this whole situation uh, into account. And it's written very dispassionately, and, it, and it's very difficult to read. And over the years, various biblical commentators have tried to pin the blame on her um, and, and that sort of thing. And, it, and it's really quite distressing. And I realize that the writer of this is doing this dispassionately, and it, it forces us to, in my view, um, develop our own moral response to what we're reading here. It's, the emotions were not being manipulated. And it reminded me of when I read Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, mm -hmm. which was another act of senseless 
should, dare I say it, evil murder, the murder of a family. Um, and Capote, he not only was the murder in cold blood, but he wrote the book in cold blood. There's no emotional manipulation in that book. And it reminded me very much of the style of the writer uh, of Judges. And so for me, I guess what, what, it, what both books, what both passages, um, books, the passage did for me was forced me to you know, look at myself internally and what was my own response to these acts without very emotional, manipulative writing. And so when I'm thinking about the idea of you know, stepping away from the Augustinian concept and going into Eastern Orthodoxy with this notion of free will, uh, my own responsibility in developing my moral reactions, my spiritual reactions, my emotional reactions to evil, that is on me and it is not something that is being um, imposed on me by a puppet master, whether it be a demiurge, a Augustinian god, or a writer. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, one of my favorite images uh, from the Hebrew Bible is played up in the New Testament as well, is replacing the heart of stone with the heart of flesh. Yeah. And I'm currently teaching a course on the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And the Psalms are a very interesting part of the Hebrew Bible because King David, the traditional author of the Psalms, though it's more complicated than that, mm -hmm. is looking toward Moses and looking toward the history, such as in the book of Judges, critically and daring to question. And one King David allows people, they gives them the language, it's okay to rage at God. Many of the Psalms are screaming at God, awake, arise, why do you sleep? Mm -hmm. It's not impious to have these emotional responses from a heart of flesh. It's only the heart of stone that's just so tied up in, this is the crime, this is the punishment. King David challenges the laws of Moses, saying, most particularly, most obviously, animal sacrifice. God doesn't want this. He doesn't want Holocaust of burnt offerings. He wants a broken and contrite heart. Again, a heart of flesh. Can we wake up to a new reality that's the spiritual meaning behind the book of Moses? Because that history is stone. It's dead. It's There needs to be an evolution of the human spirit and very much my reading of the Hebrew Bible, the history of covenants is God through baby steps, trying to teach humankind how to be human beings. And so he starts, you know, Adam and Eve, and there was a covenant in Eden and then there was Noah and then Moses. I think with Moses, God had to be pedantic. I mean, one of my favorite parts of the big book of Leviticus, God actually has to tell people, if you find a dead mouse in a bag of flour, you got to throw out the bag of flour. Just don't shake off the mouse and just say, the flour looks good to me. And he adds, I am your Lord God. <laughs> so God has to be so pedantic. When do those training wheels come off? When do we start to have to take responsibility for not only hygiene, which is half Leviticus, but also how we deal with other people and are other people truly human beings? And so when you get to the New Testament with Christ saying, you want to stone this woman for adultery because that's the laws of Moses. I say, no, which of you have no sin? That's again, human heartedness. So very much this critical evaluation, I believe you're exactly right. I didn't know you were a bishop, uh, Bishop <laughs> Peterson, that I believe that's the correct response when reading the book of Judges is, we provide the missing element, which is the human response of, what about her? What about her? Who stands for her? Who's mm -hmm. going to protect her? Because Christ protected this other woman from being stoned to death, who was just an object of scorn and ridicule. And Moses said, she must be killed. He said, no. Yeah. So again, it's again, free will, taking responsibility for the evils of the world and not becoming stone-hearted, turning a blind eye, and just assuming you know, this is the way it should be. We're allowed to object. The Psalms are about expressing your feelings with God, whether that's love and joy or anger. Mm -hmm. So if read the right way, and that's going back to Deacon John's comment, it's like these just aren't simplistic fairy tales that you can just reduce to 
simple sentences of this means this, this means that. No, it's an invitation to a dialogue of the human condition as revealed through history. And when understood that way, it becomes a very rich document indeed. Yeah. You know, again, just for uh, just a comment for, for residences that uh, that also seem to run through your head, you know, that the replacing of the heart of stone with the heart of flesh is, is a phrase that is so powerful and runs through my head almost constantly, right? We use it liturgically and it's very powerful, uh, as well as, you know, I, I pray the Psalms, you know, I, I do the daily office. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, this isn't my insight, but uh, every human emotion is there in the Psalms. You go through them all, right? And you, you yes. rage at God. And it, there's sort of a, that, that's sort of the powerful thing about doing the office is that you, yes. because you're doing it in the first person, are raging against God. And God uh, allows this. Yes. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what stuns me. I interrupted you there. I'm going to turn it back oh, please. to you. But no, I, I'm done. The yeah. fact you can be angry with God and you're not going to be struck down. That surprised me because sh shouldn't you always be meek and powerless? Within constraints, you're allowed to be angry uh, with these psalms of why do you sleep, awake, arise? I believe that's Psalm 45, you know, at God. Um, and it's allowed, and the way I read it, it gives us, if you're in that space, feel your feelings, get it out. And that's part of Jonah outside the wall starting to move back toward God. And then you go on to the next psalm, and maybe you're ready to take the next step yeah. of, I don't have understanding yet, but I'll have thanksgiving anyway. Hmm. And you take another step. You can work your way back toward God, where healing can take place. Your heart wants love, and the ultimate source of love and consummation is not the other human being in your life, but ultimately God. And then you share that love with other people, and it's like, what stops you from loving? Well, it's usually pain. It's usually trauma and it's suffering. Those are the mm -hmm. true evils in the world. And that's what religion should attempt to heal as much as it can. Yeah. I. Uh, this sounds like, a, and unfortunately, like, like I'm yanking the conversation in a whole different direction, although it does Please. tie in. And it, it's something you talk about in your in your intro, so I, I really wanted to, to discuss it. But it's... I often hear something, uh, this is very common, and I hear it a lot, something along the lines of the Hellenization of Christianity was bad, derp, derp. The, the Greeks <laughs> came and took the pure, volkish, simple thought of the carpenter Jesus who, you know, loved uh, rural, simple ideas and metaphors and couldn't possibly have sophisticated ideas and cosmologies and uh, turned the simple, volkish thought into something complicated and derp. Uh, do you see any problems with this shockingly common perspective about Hellenization? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and as an academic, it's actually kind of, it was kind of interesting. It's like walking into a cocktail party where people have been fighting for a long time, and you're listening into a conversation, and you realize, I really don't care about either side here. And what, uh, what happened, in part, is the Enlightenment was inherently a Protestant movement, a pushback against what they thought was Catholic excess. And the Protestants became convinced that the Catholics had taken what they called the original primitive Christianity and then Hellenized it and developed it mm -hmm. such that it lost the original faith of the original church. And then it became a search for who's the guilty party. And sometimes Ignatius of Antioch, they claim, is the one. But let's just use, I'm using this word as a neutral word, the myth of a primitive Christianity that was not Hellenic in any sort of way. And it's like that is a problematic assertion because Paul was trained in philosophy at Tarsus. And that world was Hellenized through Alexander the Great. Yes, you had the Maccabean Revolt to push it back against too much Hellenization, but the language of the New Testament was Greek. And that comes with words have meanings. Logos has meanings. Mm -hmm. If you drop the word logos to a Greek-speaking community, then you're bringing in all the philosophers, or at least that knowledge of suke and soul. What do you mean by that? So that change of language, the degree of Hellenization of the original Christianity of Christ and his 12 disciples and the early church as represented in the New Testament, it becomes an interesting 
unsolvable question to what degree they were Hellenized, but they were partially Hellenized. They thought in this way. Uh, Paul was uh, actually enters into a debate in Athens between the Stoics and the Epicureans and quotes Stoic philosophers at them. So, yeah, so this is an odd fight. You read it that the Protestants are convinced that the Catholics ruined the faith by making it too Greek and philosophical. But there was already movement within Second Temple Judaism of adapting to a Greek world without losing Jewish identity. You had Philo of Alexandria writing about the Logos from a purely Judaic perspective. That's part of the conversations at this time. So there was Hellenization there, but ultimately, what's wrong with being Greek? <laughs> Are Greeks terrible human beings? You know, and it's just, I kind of have a joke in the beginning of my book. It's like this whole debate would bring an odd smile to the face of a Greek patristic scholar saying, what do you mean Hellenization is a bad thing? You know, it's, and anticipating, or at least adding something to the discussion, even the early church, I believe it is Clement of Alexandria says, Greek philosophy has its place. It's the handmaid to theology. And the handmaid is helping to beautify theology with intellectual understanding. Yes, you can have the mysteries of sacraments, but how do you explain that so you can have intellectual rigor to your religion as well? They had to use Greek philosophy. And that's all the Trinitarian debates. It's you know, and then Protestants come around and says, well, it's revealed in this language and we're not going to think about the development of the Bible until the King James and just say there was a, a particular identity to the early Christian church that is revealed today and it's not Hellenized in any sort of way. But I know the Gnostics have their own particular issues with that characterization as well. But just from like the Orthodox perspective, it's like, yeah, Greek Orthodox. What's wrong with Hellenization? Yeah, precisely. I I, I find it to be a a, a very uh, silly idea. It it you know. Uh, you're right, right? When you look at the origins of it, it it's a combination of um, some atheistic streams from uh, uh, um, the, the Enlightenment and just uh, uh, weird Protestant arguing, <laughs> weird <laughs> Protestant saying this stuff is bad. And, and that's why, you know, every, every Christmas we have to hear about how the Christmas is actually pagan. That comes from the same thing. It's anyways... I, I'm getting off track because this is actually I need to do a show where I just rant about this topic because it is a bugaboo of mine. We should so, do a Christmas you. special where, where, where you get to do that. And oh, we put you up against froth, against Frothy the Squirrel. Remember that one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, perfect. Let's do it. Um, well, you know, th th this will actually be coming out. Uh, people will be listening to this in November because I'm doing all Halloween for all of October. So, yeah, I need Christmas ideas. Let's do it for all December. Okay, get it, getting back on track. Again, this might seem like a bit of a veer, but can you tell us, Dr. Gooden, like, what's the difference between theology and religious studies in the academy? And what might be some issues with this, this split? Oh, my. Oh, uh, this is where I rant. <laughs> Go Brace off. yourselves. Go um, off. <laughs> I remember when I had a master's degree and I was looking for PhD programs and I was applying to different schools and talking to people over the phone and I made the mistake of a particular religious studies school of saying something like, I've always wanted to study theology since whatever, whatever. And the guy stopped me and said, there's no place for God in religious studies. And he did not mean that ironically. There is a particular brand of religious studies, and it comes out of this Enlightenment movement, where religious studies is an historical science. There is no metaphysics. You have the world of the text, you have critical tools, there's historical analysis, a genre analysis, historical criticism, literary criticism. There are various things we can do without making judgments to the realities described in the text. Religious studies is a science. Theology is like anything goes, you make up stuff according to that worldview. And I've heard that quite often. And actually, interesting, I have a colleague who says it's actually worse to out yourself as an atheist in religious studies in some times. That you're not supposed to have, you're not supposed to have a personality and be a scholar. <laughs> and this is something that 
Because let's say you are religious studies. I have a PhD in religious studies. You see behind me on the wall here, I'm also a religious person. There's an icon of the Theotokos. That means I can't be objective because I've made a determination of the realities described in the text. Therefore, discount everything I say because I'm not critically objective. This is something in academia. I've actually encountered it. My field is actually religious studies and ecology. They overlap. Mm -hmm. And I've met a number of conservation biologists. Their job is conservation biologists. But as soon as they identify that they're activists, that they care about the uh, biodiversity of Ethiopia, then they're no longer objective scientists and a colleague of mine who I've published with has been pushed out of academia because she was too much of an activist to try to preserve the sacred forests of Ethiopia and not just study them. So academia really tries to take the humanity out of scholarship mm -hmm. such that you can't care about biodiversity, you can only study biodiversity, and you can't care about the religious reality studied uh, in patristic texts, you know, you can't care about that. They're only historical documents. And if you ever, in certain circles, if you suggest that you actually a believing practicing Christian, then you're no longer objective and you must have an agenda and you wrote with biases. Fortunately, there are, like one of the places I teach at is uh, Pappas Patristic Institute in Brookline, Massachusetts, with the Greek Orthodox School of Theology. It was the first time where I saw scholars in a religious setting and going to services at the same time. And I'm here. It's possible. You don't have to hide the fact that you're religious. You don't have to say the historical Jesus all the time. You can actually say Jesus Christ. And lightning's not going to strike you out of the sky. But it's not universal. There are places in academia that if you're a religious studies scholar and you go to church, they will look down on you. So it really depends on the institution. I have some colleagues say they've never had a problem being a person of faith and being a scholar. And I had other people saying, oh yeah, it can be a problem. Yeah. Well, it, it's really funny because um, if you went to business school and you had professors who worked in business and made a lot of money, that wouldn't be seen as a conflict. If you're taking the hard sciences and your professor is also a scientist, that wouldn't be seen as a problem. Yes. But yes, here it is as a problem. It, it also, it, you mentioned this in, in your book as well. It's specifically often Christian, right? Because yes. I, I did an undergrad in religious studies, and and I'm not trying to be critical of, of the program ready professors, but you know I, I had a Buddhist class that was you know taught by a Buddhist, and it really was from a Buddhist perspective. And then I I took a number of classes on Islam from a, a very well known um, uh, Islamic scholar who's working within the tradition, who's an imam, and you know really, uh, if I had gotten into some sort of critical source text style stuff i'm like i will fail this course so but of course you know that was fine with those other faiths but any of the crit uh, uh sorry the new testament hebrew uh the hebrew bible courses that i took well, you know this is a science where uh that this is anthropology this is history there's no room here for uh for uh theology so uh so i have i have personally experienced that uh, as well and I, I thought it was sort of strange to be taking these courses you know at the same time where it's all right for some faith communities but not others um Indeed. yeah um okay orientating back to it and this this is a big question i know uh but can you tell us a little bit at least about how the the patristic fathers read the scriptures in response to the problem of evil and can you tell us about some of the relevant texts and some of the interpretations and and <clears throat> i know that this is an enormous you know question but uh, mm -hmm. a few examples uh it breaks in two directions um one of which is and I know it's a topic we're going to head to in a moment. I'll just like flag it here. Is many of the patristic fathers that were also monastics wanted to experience God through a type of intellectual community, through a noetic embracing of spiritual realities. And so the problem of evil becomes how to purify one's own heart in order to be present to God. And so many fathers write about the problem of evil with respect to anger or wrath or gluttony or slothfulness or untruthfulness or 
resentment or lust or whatever the barriers within a person becomes a conflict with others and themselves. And that was one direction. The other direction was homilies that would come from uh, priests and bishops and archbishops speaking to their congregations, whether about evil in general or particular evils they were suffering. Like Basil uh, the Great of Caesarea was caused, was driven to write about a particular drought and famine that hit Cappadocia in the fourth century. And so he'd write about the problem of evil in context of that in order to educate the congregation about why these things were happening. And so generally those are the two directions the fathers had an occasion to write about the problem of evil rather than the other things they would write about. So there, I want to see which direction you want to head. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I actually do want to move on to, to the next question because we're starting to run a little bit long. Um, uh, although, you know, we can go as long as it takes because this is all fascinating. But, but I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about the latter divine ascent because it's something that we talk a lot about on this show. And can you tell us what it is and what it has to do with evil? Yes. Uh, the typology, the, the image in the Hebrew Bible is Jacob's ladder where Jacob had a vision of a, a very wondrous thing, of a ladder that reached up to the heavens, and upon it were ascending and descending angels. And what this image showed was a connectivity between heaven and earth, a dialogue that was taking place. And for the patristic fathers, the ladder of divine ascent, it became the symbol, the typology for, can we do this through a contemplative life? And where each rung of the ladder represents another step toward heaven, another step toward reaching a communion with God of heart and mind, and each ladder representing usually an object of purification, of purifying the heart, purifying the mind, a bodily discipline, of asceticism, to empty oneself of all... Let's, like, I was going to say ego. I'm going to sound pretty Buddhist here. But it's called apophatic theology. You had to negate the self in order to become a, something that could resonate with the divine presence. Ultimately, their goal was to experience the ineffable light of the creator. That what is often seen as halos in icons is the uncreated light of God that only a few enlightened people will see that they'll see this divine light around people, and it's not a sensible light instead of through the senses. It's illuminated to the mind. And so the ladder of divine ascent is how do you move up this ladder? But at the same time, you can fall off the ladder. And sometimes you fall off the ladder because demons are poking you with sticks and trying to make you fall down and fall to earth. And usually that image is a representation of things that distract you from your spiritual life whether that's you're trying to pray and you start daydreaming or fantasizing about something else. And it's like, where's that coming from? And there's different types of sin. There's a sin that comes from habit, which is not, you know, it's just an ingrained thing that you do. And it's like, how do you work through that? Because the demons will try to keep people from experiencing God in the flesh, in this life. And so the ladder divine ascent are those who make it try to make up the ladder and those who are falling down because they fall into error of some kind. There's like uh, some interesting stories from the Desert Fathers that certain monks would like be praying and they think they would have a vision of God where God says, throw yourself off the cliff and the angels will catch you and carry you to heaven. And they start running <laughs> toward the cliff and the elder of the community has to physically tackle them and say, that wasn't an angel that was talking to you. That was a demon. Don't throw yourself <laughs> off a cliff. So that is a ladder of divine ascent of, like, the few who are called to do this, because it is a dangerous task, because you're actually attracting the attention of the demons, mm -hmm. yeah. whether that's prepossessed sins. And it's like, you know, the ultimate torture is, is solitary confinement. This is what the monks did to themselves. They'd yeah. be in their cells for like 23 hours a day, just praying alone with nothing but their thoughts. How do you not go crazy? And 
the Philokalia is kind of their step-by-step -step guide of how to navigate the ladder of divine ascent in order to have an experience of God in this life. No, exactly. And if you don't want to take demons as literal, you know, anybody who's done a meditation retreat knows what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they show up pretty quick, um, yes. <laughs> whether they be literal or not literal or something in between. So talking about demons, another easy question for you, Dr. Good, and mm -hmm. another one that you can answer in a couple words. Uh, who is Satan? <laughs> why does he exist? And why is it helpful to have a psychological profile of this figure and to know his motivations. That came up in my research, and I said, well, I need to write about this uh, for a number of reasons. Um, he is the central figure in es eschatolo uh, eschatology and apocalyptic imagination. And you get hints of his story of being a cherubic angel, Lucifer, who somehow became darkness and the source of evil and how did that uh, come to play and creating a psychological profile one of the things that's revealed and i don't think i highlighted enough in my book but what is useful to talk about is because people today tend to inherit an image of evil as a darth vader type figure <laughs> someone who has evil powers that are like antimatter which is the exact opposite of the good powers, which is like matter. And so like Darth Vader fights against a noble Jedi, you need to have these two balancing powers fighting with, with energy and spells and magic and things like that. That's mostly Hollywood. Uh, Patristic fathers kind of show him as a pathetic figure whose only power is suggestion. Hmm. They will say like the devil will get in your head and pretend to be your voice of your inner monologue of saying, why are you doing this? You know, don't do this. It's like, go out and have fun instead. This is too hard to do the office today. And then later the devil will go on and say, you're such an idiot. Why'd you go out today? You're supposed to do, do, uh, do your prayers. God will never forgive you. So the devil mostly just uh, gives you really bad advice. And some of the fathers write about him. He's not all that powerful, but... He definitely causes mischief in the world, using mm -hmm. the Islamic term, and wants to destroy people because that's the only way he can avenge himself against God. And he tries to be your friend, but then I mean, there's this wonderful image by Maximus Confessor where the devil's trying to be your friend. And then on the day of judgment, he's going to be the prosecuting attorney and say, I'll tell you what David did. Oh, my, I was there. And he, did, he suddenly turned. He's very petty. He's going to stab you in the back. So whatever good advice you think he's giving you today, you know, he's going to be there to uh, snitch on you at the day of judgment. So it's kind of interesting to kind of deflate his importance as far as, you know, he's not Darth Vader, uh, but it is a powerful figure who represents, I mean, it's always said his sin is pride. But it's really this pride in the sense of, like the book of Job, you mentioned that earlier. There's, It's very curious in the book of Job, God is still on speaking terms with Satan. Yeah. Satan shows up and he asks, where have you been? I've been on the earth going to and fro. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And it's almost like he's trying to teach Satan, like, can you come around? Have you considered my servant Job? He loves me. And when we get to the time of the New Testament, you know, Christ doesn't want to speak to the devil at all. He only quotes scriptures at him. But Satan becomes a rather pathetic figure. The entire book of Job can be read as trying to see if Satan would give up his self-willed exile from God. You know, Satan is, like even the, uh, the church fathers of the Eastern tradition says, pray for the devil. Because one, it's going to piss them off, but two, it's good for your own soul. Yeah. The devil's a pathetic figure. You know, he's evil, he causes trouble, he causes mischief, he's brought many people to ruin, but he's really lost, lonely, and miserable. And he represents our fate if we choose, like Jonah outside the walls. Does he stay in exile forever? If he does... He becomes lost. 
he never has communion with God, he's going to be lost to that darkness within of his own anger and despair. And so Satan is useful as a warning for what we can become if we give into resentment and that type of, you know, pride. You can scream at God, but eventually you have to start moving back toward the light. When you're ready, be hurt and angry as long as you want to, you need to, as much as you think you have to, but not forever. Start making steps back toward the light and find the help you can along the way to help you with those issues. And that's why I wrote the book. One of the things that's been useful yes. to me is thinking of Satan as the accuser versus Christ, the revealer. Yes. And you can, you can accuse somebody and you can you know, weave a tale and whatnot. The, the truth may not be there, though. I mean, it's just an accusation. But for some people, that's enough to make them crumble. Uh, when you have, however, an advocate and that, that reveals things, well, at this point, we now begin, we start getting to someplace that's constructive. Yes. Actually, that word advocate appears in the book of Job. Job says, I know my advocate is in heaven. And yeah, yeah and very literally, uh, Satan, according to Maximus Confessor, becomes our accuser of why, yeah. why we should be damned. It's like you have a choice which direction you should follow. And... Hopefully your heart is not so lost that you know the light can be good, but it's tough to make those steps back toward it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gooden, uh, I, I guess at the end of the day, you know, we have more than 200 episodes. Uh, as, I, as I was saying at the top of the show, we, we have a lot of content. We're always putting out more. So we don't have any issues uh, about leading people into heresy. But in the Eastern Orthodox context, the believers get some some bad ideas about the Odyssey from internet misinformation. Can you oh, tell us? A, yeah, can you tell us about some of these bad ideas and the misconceptions in in the Orthodox context from the Orthodox Eastern Orthodox uh, perspective? Well, um, if you ever want to ruin your day, enter <laughs> into uh, an internet flaming war with misinformation on whatever social media you use. Eastern Orthodoxy is no exception. Um, the internet, one of, I'm figuring out how, how to state this, and maybe the best way to state it is just inartfully, by just uh, not trying to formulate the perfect answer. There is There has been a, like, let's start, let's use the pandemic. Like you'd see along the misinformation, it's like, uh, there's no way you can get uh, COVID from communion because God. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it becomes a, they, somehow someone has said, this is a test of faith. If you have true faith, you'll not be not afraid to embrace each other. You see evangelicals doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. They have a rallies in the United States. And this, and actually, the Orthodox get fall into this that somehow the government, in trying to control a pandemic, is being tyrannical and trying to replace your faith in God with the faith in science. There's like a weird sphere of people are no longer looking to, in the Orthodox case, the church fathers, and looking toward whatever bias and politics. They want to believe on the internet. And so you'll see uh, in January 6th, the United States, there was a, oh, a cat. I'll see yes. if mine will show up. <laughs> there was a, an insurrection in the United States. There was an Orthodox priest that was part of that. Mm. And he was not defrocked. Yeah. He was leading a revolution in the Capitol and you're know, preaching, uh, we'll tell our kids uh, we'll be, we're part of the second American revolution. And the church kept them. And so, yeah, there's the Internet has become a source of politics that is not the spirit of the church fathers. And what I study, it's uh, the older the text, the better, as far, as far as I'm concerned. And so it was very much a wide open question. But, yeah. On the internet and social media, pretty much any conspiracy theory will find someone willing to listen to it. And the harder you deny it, it's like uh, even more particular example that 
uh, flat earth theory. Uh -huh. That apparently quite a few evangelicals are part of that because there's like one place in the book of Revelation where the earth is described using a Greek word that typically means plateau. Therefore, that means the earth is flat. And the more you deny it, the more you're glorified because, you know, blessed are you when they persecute you and say all bad things about you. And it's breaking of our families. It's a real thing. Yeah. People come up with the absurd thing of this is a test of your faith. The Bible says the earth is flat. It does not. You know, it's just some people claiming there's that word that means plateau. And it's like, unless you embrace that, if you're not ashamed of your faith, then you must believe the earth is flat, no matter what people tell you. You just smile when you say this, this. And the same thing goes with climate change. And the same thing goes with COVID. And the same thing goes with whatever. And it's almost like they're being trolled, but don't realize it. Let's see if we can make them do the stupidest stuff and say it's a test of faith. And they'll get a jewel in their crown. Hard. Yes. <laughs> I'm a martyr from, and it breaks apart families. It does. It, it absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, Dr. Gooden, we, we did already touch on this, but I guess if you can elaborate on it, you know, when we were talking about Augustine, but but uh, many Western Christians, including many Gnostic Christians, they say that, that evil exists so that we can have free will and choose God. Is, is this the Eastern Orthodox view? And if not, can we explore some of the teachings on free will, or if, if that is the view, if you could clarify it? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I would actually say... I would reverse the order. Uh, we have free will, therefore evil exists. Yeah. Rather than, and I'm pretty sure that's what you meant anyway. I mean, evil in the sense of pain and suffering, trauma, injustice, and crime, these things that we experience in our lives is because people have free will. And one of the most powerful parables from the New Testament uh, comes from Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, where a certain overseer gives three people a sum of money called a talent. And at the end of their days, they're called for, what have you done with it? He says, well, I invested it and made twice as much. Oh, you're a faithful servant. You're going to get so much more. It's actually using the language of the kingdom. And there's another guy who says, I know you're a cruel uh, overseer, so I just buried the talents in the dirt, and here you have them back. And he's thrown into darkness. I mean, very much... The idea of judgment. Matthew 25 is about judgment. It's another example. And so with our free will, have we made the world a better place? What have we done with our talents? There's this beautiful pun, you know, going back to the very beginning of this discourse. You know, talent means something particular in English that works very well with this analogy. What have you done with your yeah. talents? Yeah. Have you made the world a better place or have you only been selfish and cruel and hurt people? This is how you will be judged. The world is evil because people are using their free will to not be their brother's keeper. The first sin in the Bible of after Eden, of Cain and Abel, of hurting other people or neglecting other people. The, in orthodoxy, there's a strong distinction between the image of God and the likeness of God. The image of God is a birthright. The likeness of God is what you do to manifest that image. It is virtue. It is what is how you reveal through your own behavior the likeness of God in the world. And so central to your own redemption is how much you've taken the image of God and revealed that in your life through your behavior. Or have you erased the image of God through bad behavior? Uh, you kind of use the analogy of a coin. A fresh coin will have a very sharp image, but a very old coin will be worn down. And that's what our bad behaviors or our sins, however they are, will face the image of God from our lives. And when that happens, evil fills the world through care, uncaring indifference or actually perpetuating evil. Uh, somewhere in the beginning of the discussion, this image of people can become so desensitized to pain and suffering by other people that... They no longer respond emotionally when they hear about traumas. It was like yeah. a woman that was raped in a train the other day and no one responded. Yeah. Um, people see uh, other people die in the news and they become hardened to it. Yeah. Where is our outrage? And so a lot of the problem of evil, I titled the book Confronting Evil, because ultimately that's part of the answer is we're meant to confront evil by manifesting the likeness of God in our behavior. 
and I get into things like natural evils like famine and uh, moral evils such as war, uh, you know, in two particular chapters of the book. So, yeah, it's uh, the problem of evil. Why doesn't God do something about it? Well, God delegated that to people who have the image of God. What have we done about it? The problem of evil is ultimately the problem of humankind refusing to take up our birthright and just burying our talents in the dirt. Yeah, well, that, that's the perfect ending place. Uh, uh, Dr. Gooden, we uh, we do put this out as a video. It's primarily a video show, but also as an audio show. So we have been flashing the name of your book and your publisher on screen. But for those listeners, can you tell them about where they can get the book? Okay, there's a little bit of story there. You can't get it on Amazon. Well, your audio listeners won't appreciate the cover I'm flashing <laughs> now. It's only through Alexander Press in Montreal that I actually have a very beautiful uh, image on the cover. It comes from a world-famous iconographer. And for the licensing rights, I had to go through a particular publisher here in Montreal, Alexander Press. I believe it's only uh, $30 Canadian. And so... Like, uh, through... that's uh, 27 cents ca uh, American. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not quite <laughs> sure on the exchange rate, but it's, yes. it's a deal for the American listeners and yes. viewers. So, yes, Alexander Press in Montreal is where you can get it. So. Excellent. Uh, AlexanderPress.com. That's Confronting Evil, The Odyssey of the Eastern uh, Patristic Tradition. Before we sign off, uh, Bishop Blaney, do you have any plugs? Uh, not at this time. I probably will coming up very soon. Well, actually, I, can, I have this. For those of you who would like to pray for me, there is something that I'm doing right now. I'm starting a radio station. Um, and this is a long-held dream of mine, perhaps a talent of mine uh, that I am sowing uh, for my community and a desire to bring back um, really good radio. So if those of you who would like to pray for me, uh, I would really very much appreciate your prayers at this time because I am dedicating probably the next decade of my life to this. And I, I do solicit your prayers. It's called uh, World Perspectives Radio Chicago. You can look it up on Google. Right now, it's just music playing, but we are moving forward with this. So anybody who wishes to pray for me, I would appreciate that. Amazing. Prayers up for Lainey and this exciting project. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it on the show. Um, for my plugs, it's uh, mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I, I'm a very broke writer, but that's not all, folks. I'm also a very broke meditation coach. <laughs> so I have, some, I have some training and experience in uh, secular mindfulness, in uh, the psychological application of meditation. So every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Montreal time, that's Eastern Standard Time, New York time, uh, it, it, we do online meditation. Uh, it's for both beginners and those that have experience. Again, you don't have to be religious. You can be religious. It doesn't matter, right? This is uh, secular mindfulness, and it's how I get some more experience and also give back because sometimes I feel guilty uh, charging money for it. So, uh, so mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, my parish in Montreal is holygrail.substack.com. Check that out. Uh, you know, COVID still kind of going on. There's still some restrictions in Montreal. I kind of took a summer break. We're going to do a mix of online and in person. So if you're in the area, come and check us out. If you're not in the area and you want to stick your head into a session, uh, chances are holygrail.substack.com. Uh, we will be doing, you know, uh, I think I'm going to do half online, half in person. Uh, finally, not a plug for me, but twitch.tv slash Gnostic Wisdom. We're doing more live streams on Twitch. Uh, we're doing uh, all sorts of things, like uh, live uh, role plays of the tabletop game Cult. So we have a team doing that. Very fun. Uh, uh, Father Tony is sometimes doing some Gnostic-themed gaming on there. And uh, this will actually come out before... No, this will come out after the next live stream. So uh, go back and we do archive them. It's the last Tuesday of the month, but they're archived. Uh, but go listen or watch the uh, Lovecraft stream. Uh, this, which this uh, is being taped before, but will be coming out after. Um, so uh, this is uh, Deacon Jonathan Stewart signing off and saying so. Uh, thanks so much, Doctor Gooden. Take care. Thank you so much, Doctor Gooden. Well, thank you, Deacon John and uh, Bishop Peterson. Thank you, Crab. Thank you so much. Uh, and